Hello, I'm Ralph Gable of the Electronics for the Inquisitive Experimenter YouTube channel. Phase lock loops, or PLLs, well, they're everywhere. And this is a huge topic and worthy of several videos. This video is just an introduction to the topic. Now, there's a lot of high-level math that goes into the design of a PLL. And you will be relieved that I'm not going to go into all that math. Oh. Nonetheless, by the end of this video, I hope that you will have an appreciation for what is under the hood and a general idea of how they do what they do. Now, in preparation for this video, I have simulated each of the various types of phase detectors as well as a VCO using LT Spice. You will find a link to a zip file down in the description below which contains all of these simulation models. Feel free to download them and, well, play with them. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to add a comment to this video. If you find this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe. Now, the first question, what the heck are these things? So what is a phase lock loop? Good question. First, we notice that the word loop is in the name. Now this tells us that this is a circuit that sports some sort of feedback loop. What this means is that some form of what comes out of the circuit is brought back as an input to an earlier part of the circuit. This feedback loop could have some sort of function associated with it like, well, frequency division or gain or phase shift or other such thing. Second, we see the whole phase locked business. This tells us that the phase of the output of this circuit is somehow kept in place by the action of the circuit. It is locked in place. Because we have this feedback, we understand that the phase of the output is locked to some other input to the circuit. In fact, the phase of the output is constantly being compared to the phase of this input and adjusted so that it remains synchronized to the input. If our input is very frequency stable, then the output will also be very frequency stable. This whole discussion leads us to this block diagram. Well, starting from the left, we see the input. This is what the phase of the output is going to be locked to. This next block is where the phase of the feedback signal is being compared to the phase of the input signal. The output of this circuit is a voltage which is proportional to the phase difference between the two signals. Now we come to the filter block. This is needed to provide, among other things, overall stability to the system. Any time we have any kind of system involving feedback of some kind, one of our major concerns is stability. We don't want the entire system to run off into some infinite state. Thus, this filter helps us to ensure that the whole system is stable and, well, in other words, it settles into some nice, finite equilibrium. The output of this circuit is the processed version of the voltage coming from the phase comparator. More on this later. Now we come to the voltage controlled oscillator or VCO. Well, what's a voltage controlled oscillator? It is a signal source whose output frequency is controlled by the voltage provided on its input. Now, while it would be really ideal to have this be a linear relationship, this isn't always necessarily the case in every instance. Lastly, we address what I'm going to call the feedback element. This could be any one of a number of things, including a frequency divider. Now let's talk about each of these function blocks individually, starting with the phase detector or comparator. As implied by the name, the purpose of the phase comparator is to compare the phase of the input signal to the phase of the feedback signal, and then generate a voltage which represents the difference between these two phases. The output of the phase comparator is in the form volts per radian. 
Don't let this radiance business bother you. Radians is just an angle measure similar to the degrees that we're used to talking in terms of. There are two times pi radians in 360 degrees. Now there are two basic camps for phase comparators. These are referred to as type 1 and type 2. So let's talk about type 1 phase comparators first. Type 1 phase comparators or detectors are designed to be driven by either a digital or an analog input depending upon the particular configuration of the comparator. So let's talk about the digital form first. Well, the simplest form of a type 1 phase detector for digital signals consists simply of an exclusive OR gate followed by an RC filter to create a DC voltage from the pulsed output of the exclusive OR gate. This type is measuring the time difference between the edges of the digital clock signals. You can kind of think of this as producing a DC voltage from a pulse width modulated signal. The amplitude of the resulting DC is proportional to the phase difference between the two signals connected to the input of the exclusive OR gate. Here I have one such example that I have done a quick simulation of. I have two signal sources. One is our reference signal and the other represents the feedback signal from the output of our PLL. Next, we have an exclusive OR gate followed by an RC filter to turn the pulsed gate output into a DC signal with, well, some ripple. Following this, I have an amplifier which is also a low pass filter to further refine the output of the gate. Everything past the exclusive OR gate itself is actually the loop filter block which I will cover in a bit more detail later. In this first example, both signal sources are at the same frequency and the same phase. Notice the output of our phase detector. It is on the order of single digit millivolts and it is unchanging. And this little bit of DC voltage is due to the op amp used as the amplifier and low pass filter. Now let's take this same circuit and give one of the two signals a little bit of phase difference by delaying it just a little bit. I am inducing a fixed phase variance from the two signals by delaying the second input by one microsecond. Notice the output of the exclusive OR gate. We now have pulses of a fixed width. And now the output of the phase detector rises to a fixed output voltage indicating the fixed phase variance. Lastly, I'm going to take the same circuit and change the second input to a slightly different frequency but with no initial delay. What this means is that the phase variance will be ever increasing as time goes on because they're two different frequencies. Looking at the output of the exclusive OR gate, we can see pulses of ever increasing width. The output of our phase detector shows a nice ramp as expected because the phase difference is ever increasing with each successive cycle of our input signals. But what about analog signals? To begin this discussion, we have to define what we mean by phase difference when it comes to a sine wave. The standard way to define phase difference is the time difference between two signals when they cross their zero degree point in their own phase. With a signal that is centered around zero volts, this is where they cross the zero volt level going in the positive direction. So how do we capture this? There are two different methods that I'm going to talk about here, and the first is a four quadrant multiplier, otherwise known as a balanced mixer. Yep, you got it. It's the exact same thing that's used to create and to demodulate double sideband suppress carrier signals. This is intended for two sinusoidal signals. Now, I'm not going to go into all the math as to why this works. I will show you this simulation to demonstrate that it does indeed work. Here we have what is known as a Gilbert cell balanced mixer, which is the type most often found in the integrated circuits which sport balanced mixers.
If I were to be generating a double sideband suppressed carrier signal, I would feed the audio in one port and the RF in the other port. Here, I'm feeding two identical 200 kHz signals into both ports. On the output, we find the expected 400 kHz signal of a given amplitude which is riding on some given DC level. Now, watch the DC value carefully when I introduce a fixed phase difference to one of the two signals. Did you see the DC value change? We still have the high frequency content at 400 kilohertz at the same peak-to-peak -peak amplitude, but what has changed is the DC value that this is writing on. In other words, the average value of the voltage has changed. So what happens if I change the frequency of one so that the actual phase difference is continually changing? Now the output frequency will be unchanged while the phase is changing consistently, but look at the DC voltage that it's riding on as the phase changes with time. Mathematically speaking, the DC level is expressed this way. The voltage, which is showing the phase, is equal to some amplitude times the sine of the phase difference. And now that we've seen the data, this should be no surprise at all. The high frequency content just tags along for the ride. It also should not be too much of a surprise that this limits the effective range of the detector to plus or minus 90 degrees, or pi over 2 radians. Now, there is a way to accomplish this and avoid this high frequency content. It is called the sample and hold method. We'll take a look at that one next. So let's take a look at this way of doing things. We have the first input to the phase detector, which is our sine wave input going to the first sample and hold switch. We have the second input to the phase detector, which is our square wave input. This is what is used to operate the sample and hold switches. Notice that the second switch gets an inverted version of this signal. Now this means that the second switch is open when the first switch is closed and vice versa. Now let's think about how this works. When the second input closes the first switch, the voltage on the capacitor that's on the output of that switch follows the voltage of the input. When the switch opens, the capacitor voltage remains unchanged, reflecting the voltage of the input at the time that the switch opened. At the same time that the first switch opens, the second switch closes to sample the output voltage of the first switch. It holds on to this during the time that the first switch closes. When there is a constant phase difference, and the two input frequencies are exactly the same, the voltage will always be the same, as you can see here. Now, suppose that one of the two frequencies is different. Now, like before, this means that the phase will actually be changing with each successive cycle. So let's see how this looks. Notice that, like the mixer style, the response is sinusoidal it turns out that it is dictated by the same formula as the mixer style. This means that it has the same limitation of plus or minus 90 degrees or pi over 2 radians. Now here in this one, I'm using the official sample and hold building blocks in this simulation. Notice how much cleaner the response is. Now I'm going to set the sampling frequency, which is the second input, to one half the analog input frequency. Now we can see that we've extended the useful range to plus or minus 180 degrees or pi radians. Also notice that the high frequency component is gone. All we have is the DC component to deal with. Nice.
Now for a brief touch on Type 2 phase detectors. This Type 2 phase detector is for use with digital signals only. It contains flip-flops as memory elements along with other logic. It responds to the positive going edges of the two input signals and produces an output which clearly indicates if the phase is leading or lagging. The output drives what they call a charge pump. What they mean by this is that there's a network connected to its output which includes capacitive elements. This output pumps charge into or out of these capacitive elements producing a DC voltage which indicates the phase difference between the two input signals. You can also think of it in terms of producing a DC output from a circuit using pulse width modulated source such as a microcontroller. When the two signals are in phase, then there is no output of any kind. It is ripple free. This means that the VCO, whose frequency is determined by the voltage applied to its input, will not have any phase modulation caused by ripple from the phase detector. And that is good news. Here I have modeled a representative example of one such phase detector. Notice that it consists of two D flip-flops and a couple of OR gates. The outputs of the flip-flops control the charge pump, which is made up of complementary pair of transistors, one PNP and one NPN. The capacitive elements that follow are the loop filter elements, which I'll cover in a little bit. When the two inputs are in phase, then the output sits at 0.5 volts. Both transistors are shut off. If input 1 leads input 2 in phase, then the output rises quickly to a more positive value. If input 1 lags input 2, then the output quickly drops below 0.5 volts. Like all of the other phase detector schemes, this too has the limitation of how far out of phase the two signals can be. In this case, it's 180 degrees or pi radians. Now we get to talk about the next function block, the loop filter. As I said before, the output of the phase comparator is in the form volts per radian, where radians are an angle measurement similar to the degrees that we're used to talking in terms of. This loop filter transforms the volts per radian output from the phase comparator to the needed volts per hertz that the VCO function block needs. What this means is that the loop filter has to integrate the voltage coming from the phase detector. Furthermore, it should be at least a second order filter. Now, this sounds very complex and can make the eyes glaze over, However, it is in reality just a low pass filter which utilizes two capacitors. To accomplish this task, it could be something as simple as cascaded RC low pass filters such as what you saw in the type 2 phase detector simulation. It could also include active elements such as one more op amps like we saw with the exclusive OR gate simulation. The component values are carefully chose to reduce settling time, ensure loop stability, and to reduce the ripple in the voltage that is passed to the VCO. Any ripple in the voltage passed to the VCO will cause changes in the frequency, which result in phase modulation of the VCO output. And this is certainly not a desirable thing. Now, what about that VCO? As I said before, the Voltage Controlled Oscillator or VCO is an oscillator whose output frequency is determined by a voltage on its input. These oscillators take many forms. One such form is the standard Colpitts oscillator with an LC resonance circuit which determines its frequency like you see here. Placed across this parallel resonance circuit is a special diode. This is called a varactor diode. It is operated reverse biased. Now, without getting into the physics behind how they work, 
as the diode becomes more and more reverse biased, the capacitance seen across the diode decreases. The less reverse biased the voltage across the diode, the greater the capacitance. In reality, all diodes have this property, but these Veractor diodes are especially designed to exploit this property to a much greater degree. In its placement in our oscillator, this means that when we increase the input voltage, its capacitance goes down and the output frequency of the oscillator goes up. So input voltage up, frequency up. Pretty cool. Conversely, when we decrease the input voltage, the capacitance increases and the output frequency goes down. So voltage down, frequency down. Double cool. Now we isolate the DC control voltage input using either an RF choke or a large value resistance like I did here. The last major building block is the feedback path. Now we have the feedback path. This could be something as simple as the output connected to the input of the phase detector. However, this is often not the case. Very often, this consists of some sort of frequency divider. Thus, the output frequency would be some multiple of the reference frequency. We could have a reference frequency of 1 megahertz and the PLL output frequency of 64 megahertz. The 64 megahertz output is divided down to 1 megahertz to be applied to the input of the phase detector using a divide by 64 divider. In the past, this divider was just powers of 2. So you would divide by 2 or 4 or 8 or 16, 32, and so on. And in many cases, that still is. Then this became divide by integers only. You could divide by 2 or 3 or 4 or 5 or 23 or 51. And that's not hard to do with a little logic. But now we can find PLL sporting non-integer dividers. Divide by 900.2 or 123.4 or other odd combinations. And they do this with some pretty fancy, odd, hard to explain methods using multiple counters and jumping back and forth between them and so on and so forth. Now, there is one last thing to think about other possible additions to our PLL. Well, I would be amiss if I didn't at least mention a couple of the things that you might see in a PLL. The two most common are the prescaler and the postscalar dividers. The prescaler divider is a frequency divider which is applied to the reference signal input. Thus, the reference signal frequency can be divided down to a lower frequency before applying it to the phase detector. Variations in the frequency of the reference are also divided down, making the resulting PLL output frequency more stable. The postscaler is applied to the output of the PLL. It is taking the VCO output frequency and dividing it down before it's made available to the output. If the VCO frequency varies by 0.1 kilohertz and we divide it down by a factor of 4, then the resulting output of the PLL will vary only by 0.025 kilohertz. By choosing the prescaler, postscaler, and feedback dividers properly, we can get very, very creative in what the final output frequency will be given a specific input reference frequency. Well, there you have it, phase lock loops or PLLs in a nutshell. If you found this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, toodaloots.